Morning, everybody. Uh, I'm sure as most people in the jazz vinyl community are well aware, Blue Train by the great John Coltrane has just been reissued on Tone Poet series. I think they did a stereo and a mono, if I'm not mistaken. I'm not positive. It's not a record I went out and purchased because I've had I've heard this record for ever. It's probably one of the first uh, Blue Notes I had. Uh, going back 20 some years, <clears throat> it's a staple of the Blue Note canon. Uh, it's somewhat elevated in its status due to the players on it, including you know Coltrane, whose legacy has become so big, like Miles Davis, he kind of stands above <clears throat> the fray, which is not really uh, how these records were made or the culture they were made in. Uh, especially in the late 50s, Coltrane, Miles, <clears throat> they hadn't really ascended to that higher place in the general public's eye. Uh, you know, Miles is about to get there when he does Kind of Blue, Sketches of Spain. Miles and Coltrane together, of course, have garnered some attention, you know, and their early work on Columbia <clears throat> certainly broadened the, the popularity of both of them. But I wouldn't say Coltrane was a household name in 57. Uh, and Miles was just kind of getting there. But even so, jazz was very marginalized by this point. Jazz was very much on the way out. Uh, the swing era had come to its, you know, its fullest impact by the end of the war. And rock and roll, jump blues, R&B, these extensions of jazz that in many ways to me have more roots in jazz than a lot of the subgenres of jazz that people think of as jazz. Jump blues and the rhythm of blues, and even rock and roll, are more linked to the body of jazz than say the avant-garde is. And yet people today will staunchly defend the avant-garde as being jazz, which I mean I'm okay with that. But then you're dismissing a lot of rhythm and blues and jump blues, that stuff that came right out of the jazz and blues camps, and saying that's not jazz. So there's, there's a lot of hypocrisy, I think, in a lot of people's viewpoints on what is jazz and what's not. And rhythm and blues certainly is a kind of a straightening of the beat somewhat. Uh, the horn section is sort of shrunk down from the big swing bands. To being bands led more by guitar, drums, and bass, with a few horns articulating and emphasizing in between singers. The singer was starting to come more to the forefront. And jump blues, you know, it was mid-tempo with some horns, and it was very easy to digest, very fun and accessible. Uh, Louis Jordan was such a, a, a bridge point, and he really kind of changes the popularity of <clears throat> jazz and rhythm and blues. And in the 40s, guys like he, like Louis, owned the charts. And so by the time we're talking kind of blue and uh, blue train, jazz has been marginalized already. And I think as jazz fans, we think this is the pronounced canon, the pinnacle of the, of the movement. And it was definitely kind of happening after that pendulum had already swung away. And so jazz was kind of scrambling to remain and to find an audience in a lot of ways, even by this point. And you still see Impulse being created in late 1960. Columbia is still signing guys like Monk and Mingus in the late 50s, early 60s. So there's still this idea that jazz can once again be a mainstream popular thing. And albums like Sketches of Spain with that crossover European sound certainly sold really well. Dave Brubeck's Time Out in 59 sold really well. But let's be clear, something like Blue Train, on a small label like Blue Note in 1957-58, it's very peripheral. And it's become held in such high regard and high, such high esteem that I think today we think of it as being this canonical masterpiece that everyone around the country was talking about. And that was far from the reality of that time frame. Coltrane was an up-and-comer. You know, he comes from North Carolina. <clears throat> he worked his way up to Philadelphia. He's working with guys like Betty Golson, 
Uh, he works with the great R&B singer Earl Bostic, who was actually one of the great saxophone players of all time. And Coltrane credits Bostic a lot for a lot of his chops and ideas and innovations. Bostic was quite the player, even though a lot of his stuff was kind of saccharine crossover uh, R&B. You know, I mean, his stuff is not heavy jazz, but he was a great player all the same. And a lot of great cats came through Aud Bostic's groups. And he's one of the backbones of the King label out of Cincinnati, Earl Bostic. <clears throat> but, so Blue Train is a guy, Coltrane, who's kind of starting <clears throat> to evolve into the messianic figure that he becomes by Love Supreme. And even then, still, jazz is incredibly marginalized. Our vantage of it today and our viewpoints of it today are very skewed by the few titles that we know and that are reissued and people still talk about. We don't understand that in the landscape of the music, jazz had shrunk by 1960 to less than 1% of music sales. So Coltrane in 57, 58, he's been working with Miles. He's struggling with drugs. He's recorded for Prestige a lot in 56 and 57, doing what was called the Sheets of Sound, where he was just enumerating endless ideas and as soon as one idea wrapped up, the next one was already halfway down the train. And it was pretty much endless. And even guys like Miles would say sometimes, I don't know how he, when, he, when he stops. You know, uh, Miles was minimal, and Coltrane was the absolute opposite of that minimalism. And I think Coltrane garnered some of that restraint working with Monk in 50, 58. I think Monk had a big impact on John. But Monk had a pretty big impact on most cerebral cats. Monk was an influencer. You know, he's one of the most important figures in jazz, along with Parker, Ellington, and Armstrong. To me, those are the four cats on the Mount Rushmore jazz. But Coltrane is starting to get a name. He's starting to get his own identity, but he's still kind of searching for his trademark sound. And he hasn't got it by this point. And this is a small interlude here between his prestige era and his time in Atlantic, where he grows in leaps and bounds. And Atlantic was very open to their musicians, creating individual pieces, masterpieces, their own identity. Let's remember that Charles Mingus does Pithecanthropus Erectus and the Clown and Blues and Roots of 657 at Atlantic. One of the labels that we don't think of as being one of the innovators in jazz, but they really were open to a lot of cutting edge things, a lot of those early or Ornette Coleman records that were opening the door to a new world were on Atlantic. <clears throat> so this Blue Note period for John is a bit of a transitional period. And it would be foolish <clears throat> to not recognize the impact of the Blue Note stable on John here. And it's not like John came there and taught all these kids what to do. He was one of these kids. And that Blue Note, we played a hard, up-tempo, aggressive, hard bop. This is what we do here at Blue Note. And he's a sideman on some Johnny Griffin. He's a sideman on one of my favorite Sonny Clark records. He only shows up as a sideman maybe three or four Blue Note sessions. <clears throat> but those are all Titanic records. And when you have him playing with guys like Johnny Griffin, there's a lot of fireworks to unleash. Uh, with Sonny Clark, there's a lot of aggression and political charge to be uh, discoursed. But here in this setting, under his own leadership, he brings in Curtis Fuller, the great trombone player. He brings in Lee Morgan, a fiery young trumpet player. Uh, he Again, this is his assemblage under the Blue Note stable. Uh, young, fiery, like-minded cats. <clears throat> and there's a, a finite tuning to what Coltrane's doing at this point that you don't really hear on his prestige recordings of the same era. This record's really precise, and it's really uh, well-defined as what it is. It's a hard bop masterpiece. And the opening refrain, it's kind of a jazz standard at this point. <clears throat> and it's about tempo and chops and expression of self and soul. Uh, this record has become, like I said, somewhat of a masterpiece, one of Coltrane's uh, great achievements, 
even though it's not super innovative in any way, it's kind of what Blue Note was doing at this point. This is a Blue Note sounding record on a John Coltrane sounding record. I think that's a very important distinction to make. If you know the Blue Note canon, you know the Blue Note evolution, he's in step with everything happening at Blue Note at this point, and his sidemen are part of that uh, soup, that stew. It's not just Coltrane uh, putting down the law here. It was, this is the Blue Note way. And Coltrane fits right in with that at this point. Probably some more freedom here than he had with Miles. And there was a lot of drugs going on at Blue Note at this point. Uh, you know, Blakey and his crew. Uh, it's a pretty incredible piece. Beautiful artwork. You've got Philly Joe, Paul Chambers, and the great Kenny Drew, who wasn't long for Blue Note. He goes to Europe not too long. I think he goes to, uh, he goes to Europe like in 61 or 62, Kenny Drew does. And so Kenny Drew makes a few recordings of Blue Note. He has a few other records up there. And then he goes to Europe and kind of gets forgotten in America, sadly. But Drew was a great player. And uh, <clears throat> these six guys unleash what is, for the most part, this era of Blue Note to a team. And this it's surrounded on both sides of its release by other incredible titles. I've done an episodes on this back in the day. There's a run of records at Blue Note that's like five or six deep, to be precise, of Insane, but actually runs about 30, 40 deep of consecutive releases that are all landmark, top of the mark hard bop. You know, 57, 58, Blue Note really is defining the new sound in jazz. And each label has this moment where it becomes uh, a leader and less of a follower. Blue Note's very much a follower in the late 30s, early, I mean, late 40s, early 50s. Blue Note's not really defining or creating anything that's going to be considered the Blue Note sound until 56, 57, with Blakey, Silver, and that whole crew, Bird, Mobley, Morgan, etc. And so you have a very young, focused Coltrane who's hungry still. He hasn't by any means reached any kind of pinnacle or payday. And he wasn't going to get that payday here at Blue Note, which is probably partly why he does go to Atlantic. Because Atlantic probably could throw a few more pennies at him, uh, especially with the success that Atlantic was starting to have with his R&B stuff. And the 8,000 series at Atlantic is filled with stuff that was starting to chart and cross over and do well, even in white America. And so the 1,200 series at Atlantic was left to be fairly open to inspiration. So that 1200 sequence that runs at Atlantic from 55 through probably 1970, there's four or 500 records on that on that sequence that are really solid jazz records and they don't really mix the sounds. There's hints of blues and rhythm of blues at times, but that stuff mostly gets pushed to the 8000 series. <clears throat> and so again, Coltrane's kind of still hungry, he's still kind of thirsting, he's still kind of looking for a sound. And Coltrane's sound never stays too still. I mean, this is a running river. It's not a brook or uh, a still lazy river. Coltrane's ideas and inspirations are a fast-moving mountain stream that bubble and, and never stay stagnant. There's never time for uh, it to get poor smelling. It's always fresh. Coltrane's always got new ideas. But you see him here definitely borrowing from the young guys he's working with. And Morgan's an inspiration, of course. Fuller's one of the great bone players of this time. A great rhythm section is leading the way. The Blue Note sounds kind of become, again, it's not a hit-making machine. The same Motown we're talking about. This is a small indie jazz label in New York that's starting to get recognized. Blue Note as a label was very peripheral up until this point. And it wasn't this record by any means that changes that. Jimmy Smith is one of the guys that really starts to put Blue Note on the map sales-wise. The three sounds are selling pretty well. The jazz messages are starting to get some renown, especially as big as that camp and musicians became. But all those records, all those artists, all those titles have become more popular today in the jazz world than they were in 57, 58 when they were being released. They've all become icons. And there's a stretch of probably 100, almost 200 records at Blue Note that every title in that sequence from about 57 
through 1960 or so were all considered highly regarded records at this point. And if you go through a Penguin Guide to Jazz or any of those jazz literature books that came out back in the 80s and 90s and 2000s <clears throat> that would rate records, <clears throat> every title that Blue Note was putting out was getting uh, four stars, three and a half out of four stars. <clears throat> three stars was a lower rated Blue Note in that period. And there was no two star, one star Blue Notes in that period by any of the critics' definitions. And that's not true for Prestige at this time, or Riverside even. Those records had, those labels had records that were rated one and a half stars, two and a half stars. You know what I mean? There's a, there's a wider range of what they were doing. They hadn't made their sound so finite. But Blue Note's doing just classic after classic after classic after classic after classic. And it's really got an unrivaled stretch for a jazz label to do stuff that was just, I mean, it's all part of the canon now, all of it. And that's pretty impressive. And there's times where you want to include all the Prestige titles, all of the Argo titles, all the Embassy titles, all these great labels, body of work. But when you really look at it, the stuff that's getting reissued in Japan and Europe, even today here in America, that's going to be the canon to the most collectors today. And most of that Blue Note stuff's been in print and will be in print for eternity, as far as I'm concerned. And so you have a hungry Curtis Fuller who's kind of just established himself as well. He's got three records as a leader here at Blue Note. He uh, does a few things at Prestige as a leader. He does some stuff at Savoy as a leader. He's working with uh, Benny Golson and, uh, at Argo and, and that great uh, sex tech group out of the Jazz Tet out of Chicago. Lee Morgan has really been defining himself as a young new voice at Blue Note. He makes six records in the late 50s at Blue Note in the 1500 series that are all hungry, aggressive, young Lee Morgan records that uh, are desired by collectors today. Mobley's really kind of coming into his own. It's quite a time. Uh, Coltrane, I think, belonged in this camp. And in retrospect, Parby wishes he had stayed here longer to stay more connected to his R&B roots. Because hard pop does connect back to the blues. It does connect back to the body of the music. And it's very much connected to the black history of this genealogy. And where Coltrane goes, it certainly becomes a different landscape. And by the time he's doing Love Supreme and Kula Se Mama, and ohm and impressions and all that stuff. That's Coltrane music. That's not even jazz anymore. You know, the greats kind of can eclipse the camp that they're in. And Coltrane gets to a place where he's making his music. And it's loosely defined as jazz, but it's certainly beyond the boundaries and parameters of what we know as jazz. And again, he jumps to Atlantic and does my favorite things and giant steps. And so he's making leaps and bounds after working with Monk especially. And so Coltrane was never one to stand still long. But it still would have been cool to hear him be part of this Blue Note camp for another year to make three or four more records, especially a couple more as a leader. I think he fits right in this place. There's a, a reliance on your fellow musicians in hard bop that's different than what Coltrane creates in his own quartet later. I mean, McCoy, for all his greatness, was always in the shadow and somewhat unheard under that wave of Coltrane and Elvin Jones flurries. And again, Jimmy Garrison, the bass player, gets buried a lot as well. At the Harbaugh sound of Blue Note, each piece was finite and been part of a, a puzzle that had to kind of interlock. And so everyone had their room to speak. I think Coltrane would have benefited from being there. <clears throat> and I think we would have benefited from it by hearing a couple of great more uh, hard bop sessions with the great Coltrane on it. But the opening track is, is just a classic. and something you'll hear. I mean, jazz documentaries will always probably include that number. Uh, the next track, I mean, Coltrane is a, quite the composer already at this point. Moments Notice comes next. <clears throat> and Moments Notice is a high tempo. <laughs> High tempo, blistering. I mean, it's just, it's got the schwing. And then they move to side two. And 
I've spoken many times about locomotion. And locomotion for me, which opens up side two, was an epiphany. It was uh, one of those aha moments. Eureka, as they say. Uh, and I've, I've said this story numerous times over the years. But I listened to jazz for probably 10 years before I ever heard it or felt it. And that's a humbling thing to admit. I sat there listening to it or reading what the experts said, reading the liner notes, thinking I was getting it. You know, thinking, oh, I'm connected to that guy. I understand this. And it was locomotion that really kicked the door down and said, you yeah, haven't really quite got it yet. And <clears throat> there's a great solo here by Coltrane. Curtis Fuller does his <clears throat> solo, his verses. And he, you know, kills it. The band picks, it comes to a snap halt. Lee Morgan comes in with just fire breathing out of his horn. And part of me kind of offhandedly goes, oh, and my, I'm a musician. So I know how musicians can kind of imprint their day on what they're playing. And I'm like, oh, man, he must have got splashed at the bus stop in the rain this morning. His legs must be still wet. His trousers. He must be damp. He's angry. <clears throat> and uh, I said it in kind of an offhand way to myself, not recognizing the weight of what I just had said. And then it kind of dawns on me. It's like, oh, this is what jazz is. Jazz is the immediate expression of how I feel today using the language of this song to exp There goes Fuller, Fuller, and Fuller chomps. I mean, he's chomping away, Pac-Man. He's, he's going, pellet, pellet punching. <clears throat> but it's, it's really Morgan's break that came in with this flurry of note and sound and emotional context that sounded angry. And in retrospect, the anger probably isn't about a bus puddle. It's probably about the situation of black Americans. And it's easy to guess that. But I don't think black Americans during the civil rights era were ever too far removed from those frustrations and fears. And how could you be going through those riots and those uh, segregated schools and the National Guard and all the things that were happening, Vietnam coming on the horizon. I, how can you be a black man in America and not have that conversation part of your expression? I mean, it would just seem to stand to reason that if I'm occupied in Babylon, and my people are here in captivity, my songs are going to be about dreams of freedom. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. And so when my people struggle, <clears throat> my art will reflect that struggle and that hope for a better day, a promised land, milk and honey. You can't... A musician's too honest to not express his condition. And that was the, the moment. It was like a, a litany of realizations that... There he goes, too. I was like, ooh, he's having a shitty day this morning. You know, and it, it was just, it's just fire coming out of his horn. But it was so focused, it was so clear to me and finite that I was like, man, that's what jazz is. Jazz is an emotional expression expressing how I feel today, how I interact with the world, how I feel about it. Being spoken through an emotional process via improvisation into my instrument. That's releasing and venting what I need to say. It's therapeutic. It's, it's healing. It's, it's wonderful. <clears throat> and I think if you listen to Locomotion and Coltrane and Fuller, and they hear Morgan come in with that, the band pause, and him, him just punching that accelerator. And you feel the rest of the band coming in with a little bit more intensity, a little more, ooh, okay. You know, Chambers ups it a little bit. Philly starts, oh, shit. I got to keep up with Lee here. You know, Kenny Drew starts chomping a little bit more harder on the keys. That's the essence of jazz. It's an it's a MC grabbing a microphone, and this MC is upset. I mean, the first guy was prophetic. The second guy was cash. The third guy was angry. Chuck D. And the band had to kind of rise to that moment. And I just think it was a, a realization of improvised expression has to be a very honest thing. It's hard to fake something 
when you're not using words. Words are the ultimate deceiver. And when you're not using words, that emotion, that emoting through my inspiration, through my <clears throat> interaction with this instrument, it's a venting of my soul's ilk. And so it's a very important record for me from that standpoint, because it changed how I heard jazz. I had to re-go back and listen to everything over again. And I talked about the three brush strokes of jazz. Each player has his own environment, his own experience in, the, in that environment, and then his personality dictates how he handles his environment and his experience of the, within it. And one guy's personality might pray and find peace. The next guy might be militant and want aggression. One guy might have calm and serenity. The next guy might be comedic and flirtatious. And their personality will help you have some insight into what they're saying and where they're coming from. It's an important thing to grasp because I don't think you hear jazz or feel it until you grasp that single thing. And no two players can express from the same condition or place. And guys like Coltrane's condition and place changes all the time. So when we're talking about Blue Note, Blue Train, we're talking about a record that's risen in esteem today. So one of the high points, it's become one of the most recognized Blue Note records. Again, it was just part of the flock at that point. But with Coltrane's fame that came later on, when you're new to jazz and you look at that Blue Note canon, that Blue Note logo seems familiar to you. You're like, oh, I've seen that a lot. I've heard about Blue Note a lot. But when you look to the discography, <clears throat> it's not filled with names you know. It's not like it's filled with Coleman Hawkins and Sweets Edison you know, uh, just names that you're familiar with from your early days of being a jazz collector. It's got early Monk, early Miles, a fairly early Coltrane, and then almost everything else is anonymous to novices. Even the Blakeys and the Horace Silvers and the Three Sounds and the Jimmy Smiths, which seem fairly obvious to us today, when you're a young collector, those names don't really have any ring to them. And so because of Coltrane's fame, that... When people first look at Blue Note, Coltrane, oh. And if you do any research at all, you'll read how Miles Davis' Blue Note sessions are very formative and not his most important work. You'll read about how Monk's Blue Note sessions were some of his earliest work, but weren't regarded at all at the time and have since risen in how they're, they're seen. But that's not Monk's most important work either. <clears throat> so the two names you recognize right off the bat, you're like, they're saying these aren't that are important records. Like, oh, so why is Blue Note so important? And if these Monk records and these Miles records aren't that significant, then you see the, the Coltrane Blue Train. And it's the record that does get reviewed well. It has four, four stars. And so I think for a lot of people, Blue Train becomes the first Blue Note they own. And it's from there where the Lee Morgans and the Curtis Fullers and the Hank Mobleys and the Art Blakeys all start to come into your vantage point. And then you start spreading out into that Blue Note canon, and you recognize that every title, doesn't matter who's the leader, that stable of musicians is putting out sincere, honest music. And it's got power that's palpable. That honesty, it just, we wear it. And it's refreshing because the world's full of bullshit. Television, media, religion, everyone's spewing bullshit. And a musician's honest. Bob Marley, John Lennon, Bob Dylan, jazz players, they're being honest. And it's refreshing to us. Our soul kind of is quenched. Our thirst for real connects with it. And sometimes I don't think we realize it, but there's a power to something being genuine, to something being the real article. And you don't have to fake the validity or the power of this music. You don't have to try to pretend that it's something that's not. It will speak to you itself. You don't need to read into it. If you know your history especially, this music is absolutely some of the most important music ever made. And Blue Train fits in at this time frame, speaking for where jazz was in 1958. You know, so it is a very important record. Tone Port, I'm sure, does a great job with it. Uh, I figured it was a good time to review this record. I've talked about it many times over the years, and especially in light of the locomotion, epiphany, as I call it. <clears throat> They've slowed down here a little bit for this ballad. I'm old-fashioned, 
uh, Lazy Bird wraps it up. It's, uh, again, one of my first Blue Notes, if not my first. And it's a record I've listened to probably as much as any jazz record I own. Because for years, my jazz collection was Miles, Coltrane, and a few associated, you know, you get into the Herbie Hancocks, which takes you actually towards Manchild and uh, Thrust and those fusion records because you're because you read Bitches Brew was so important, so you have all that that stuff. And you kind of takes you out to go backwards to go back to where the music comes from because as rock and rollers and rhythm and blues guy people who are children of the eighties and nineties and seventies, we connect with that music from that era, and so when jazz goes towards that and kind of morphs that in, it becomes familiar and comfortable to a lot of us. So going earlier is taking us further from what we understand and know. So for us to go towards rock and roll and Jimi Hendrix, that makes sense for most of us. It did for me. So it takes you a while to get back and understand where jazz was in 57, 56, 55, 54. <clears throat> so absolutely grab this record while it's available. I'm sure they're going to print quite a few of this one. It should sell really well. It's certainly a landmark piece uh, that has only grown in esteem over the years. Uh, the band's beyond reproach. The label's beyond reproach. The entire thing is uh, a great entry point to Blue Note, even though it probably shouldn't be where we come in. I mean, Horace Silver and the Jazz Messengers, that should be kind of, I think, you know, along with Jimmy Smith, that should be everyone's kind of go-to. But it's not how it played out, you know. Time, time changes things. And so what was landmark for Blue Note at that point, it takes you a while to kind of get to that point now because of certain ascendancies and how jazz has descended in popularity. Uh, it would be great if jazz had bigger foundations of understanding and bigger schools of thought that taught this history and kept it in our public schools. And it sure would be wonderful if in eighth grade you took a class on the history of jazz and civil rights. I'll teach that class if you need me to. But there's a tendency to pull people away from real history and real emotional uh, entanglement and to kind of water down our history, to water down people's understanding, to lower their empathy, to lower their, to up their fear. The less people understand, the more people are going to be afraid. The more people are going to be afraid, the more hate we can foment and the divide will remain. We can do what we're doing. It's in a world where understanding prevails and fear is put aside and hate is no longer because we understand too well what's happening. <clears throat> that unity would be devastating to the status quo. So unity cannot be allowed to, to exist. The Gene Roddenberry Star Trek future of interwoven race and, and, and sex and, and religion that no longer is a, a determining factor of your status that cannot be allowed to be. The media spins a narrative due to its over-underwriters who want this narrative to be out there that keeps us uninformed and afraid and willing to hate. When we're willing to hate, we can be taught who to hate whenever. And only the enlightened, the acknowledged, the people who have learned won't be willing to be afraid of everything all the time. So I wish they would teach jazz history in eighth grade ninth grade tenth grade but again it would it would open up people's hearts and uh teach a history that we're whitewashing more by the year and so it's tough to kind of sometimes recognize that man they are trying to keep us away from that legacy they're trying to keep us away from understanding our own history and <clears throat> people who uh not to be cliche, but people who don't understand their history are ripe to repeat it. So anyway, that's today's episode. Tone Poet, go get it. It's all was great stuff. They do a great job. Uh, again, I didn't need to buy it myself. I know the record from the back of my hand. But uh, <clears throat> I got a fun episode coming on Hidden Classics coming later this week. Uh, you all be safe. Subscribe to the channel if you haven't. Hit that like button. Uh, share it with a friend. And uh, if you bought this record and are new to it, it's worth giving a listen to what I have to say here because it will teach you the landscape that that record takes place in. <clears throat> and without context, uh, no art means anything.
you know, this is punk punctured right in the middle of 57, 58 as that civil rights movement was really starting to escalate and then the urban chaos and tensions really rising. And this record's filled with that resistance, that raised fist. Uh, it's quite a, quite a time in American history and not a time that we should overlook and whitewash. Y'all be safe. You have a great day. My name is Dan the Josh Shepard. Peace.